Hi everybody. Uh, welcome to AI and you. Yeah, you. Or how I st learned to stop worrying and love new technology. So what we're going to discuss today, what is AI? Um, that's going to be the basis of what artificial intelligence is, some previous applications um, and uses of AI and technology that you probably already use. Most likely there is some AI around you probably right now in your pockets. Um, how to use AI? Um, this is really focused on ChatGBT. There are other great things that I'm not going to cover, like there is Bing um, image generation. I hear that's great. I haven't used it very much. But um, really what I'm going to focus on is using prompts and parameters to get AI, again, specifically ChatGBT, to do what you want it to do. Um, AI and the future of education, um, that I'm going to talk a little bit about. I don't know the future. I'm not going to pretend to be able to predict the future, but there are going to be applications like today. We're going to be using this in the classroom from time to time. Um, yeah, I kind of said that, but using it the proper way, um, not cheating. <laughs> that is one of the big ethical concerns, but there are other ethical concerns as well. Um, what is cheating and what is not cheating. I'll go over that very briefly. I think that's going to also evolve as um, AI evolves, as it already has since I began um, this making this presentation. Actually, ChatGPT has gone from ChatGPT version 3 to 3.5, and now they're rolling out 4 right now, which I don't have access to because um, I'm not paying for it. <laughs> and AI and social media. Um, Again, if you have social media, AI is already part of your life, and I'll tell you why in a bit. It's already among us. So what is AI? Um, quite simply, AI stands for Artificial Intelligence. Um, I think most of us probably know that already, but maybe some of us don't. Some of us, like I think we're all at different levels of AI um, using it. Um, I'm I'm pretty new to it. I've used ChatGPT a lot, that being Im image uh, generation, but that's about it. So what is artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence is defined as theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech rec recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. So it does a lot of cool things. But what does that really mean? That's a paragraph. You're just reading paragraphs at me? Let's break it down. It really just means that we um, made computer systems that can do similar things to what we can do and what we can make. And that includes visual perception like pictures, being image search. Again, I'm going to, I hear that's really, really great. Um, I've used it a few times speech recognition and hearing so um you know when your phone when you are talking to your phone maybe you use duolingo or you use google translate um or maybe you've said something like hey siri or uh, alexa those are incorporations of ai um decision making too and that makes decisions like us that would be um a good example of that is like if you if you're parents have a car or if you have a car you're I, I teach freshmen so hopefully none of you have cars yet um, like lane rec um, recognizing lanes in cars that's pretty common in cars nowadays where um, I know in my mom's car if she goes over the white line she'll hear a little beep and it will auto correct for her and get her back into the lane she's supposed to be in um, translation so again that's that's speech recognition um, also um, but turning one language into another so if you use um, Google Translate which I do a lot as an educator especially for Espanol um, that's gonna turn my English language into Spanish um, which is really really helpful and also writing so this is what ChatGPT is best at it is really geared towards writing paragraphs and essays and poems and even books but you don't want to do that you want to use your brain you don't want to let ai do everything for you because that is where growth is going to happen and in school you are here to grow um 
again, I teach freshmen. You guys are not done growing. None of you, <laughs> none of you um, should be the complete form of yourself yet. So we're gonna watch a little video. Um, instead of me just talking at you, I know I know videos um, that visual um, learning is really important. So let's just watch this. It's about two minutes long. Can AI replace humans? Sometimes, yes. Siri, Alexa, Cortana, and Google Assistant. These are all forms of AI or artificial intelligence, but AI extends far past voice-activated assistance. AI is the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computer systems, and almost all businesses today employ some type of AI, some more complicated than others. AI can be categorized as weak or strong. Weak AI is a system designed and trained for a particular task, like voice-activated assistance. It can maybe answer your question or or obey a programmed command, but can't work without human interaction. Strong AI is an AI system with generalized human cognitive abilities, meaning it can solve tasks and find solutions without human intervention. A self-driving car is an example of strong AI that uses a combination of computer vision, image recognition, and deep learning to pilot a vehicle while staying in a given lane and avoiding unexpected obstacles like pedestrians. AI has made its way into a variety of industries that benefit both businesses and consumers like healthcare education, finance, law, and manufacturing. In fact, many technologies incorporate AI, including automation, machine learning, machine vision, natural language processing, and robotics. The application of AI raises legal, ethical, and security concerns. For instance, if an autonomous vehicle is involved in an accident, liability is unclear and hackers are using sophisticated machine learning tools to gain access to sensitive systems. Despite the risks, there's very few regulations governing the use of AI tools, but experts assure that AI will simply improve products and services and won't replace us humans anytime soon. So you can be relieved to find out we're not gonna be replaced anytime soon, um, so that's great. Um, but as you notice, there are, um, here, let's go to the next Can AI slide. replace Oops. humans? Let's go to the next slide and talk about this. So, um, a short summary. So what AI does is simulates human intelligence with machines. So like chat GPT, um, that is going to simulate like us writing, us thinking to some extent, even, um, it can give you some soft opinions on things, um, but really, really writing is ChatGPT's strength. Um, AI can be weak or strong. Weak AI is designed for a specific task like voice recognition. So that's like your Alexa's, your Siri's, your uh, uh, my phone is a Google phone. So I say, okay, Google, when I talk to it, hopefully it doesn't pop up. It didn't, great. Um, and that can't work without human interaction or input. So your um, your Alexa isn't just going to like wake up in the middle of the night and uh, play a song or whatever. You know, it's not thinking by itself. It needs you. Strong AI actually kind of does think on its own, which is really cool. Um, and that is AI with generalized human cognitive abilities. This means it can solve tasks without human intervention. So like self-driving cars, which are becoming a bigger and bigger thing, they're actually testing them out in San Francisco right now. And in San Francisco, you're seeing a lot more cars with nobody in them, which is um, interesting. But um, I'm gonna refer to The Simpsons and The Simpsons in episode on that about 20, uh, yeah, about 20 years ago. I think like 25 years ago, actually. Homer becomes a truck driver and is literally like sleeping on the hood of his truck as his truck drives. Good episode. Look it up. <laughs> um, and strong AI, both types of AI have been used for many years, but I want to focus on strong AI because I think that's the one people are more scared of in the form of automation. So most factories are, you know, uh, robots are building building things in factories all the time without human input. You know, we kind of just flip a switch on and it does its thing. 
Um, AI that you or your family may already use, so like I said, Siri, Alexa, other voice recognition software that you may use to ask questions on your phone or device. Um, computer systems, so computers have tons of AI in them. Um, we're going to get to social media in a little bit and how that is incorporated, um, how AI is incorporated in it, I should say. And then systems in cars, again, that's that's that strong AI, self-driving, lane departure system, auto braking, um, and yeah, so on to the next slide. So for the next three minutes, and for the sake of this video, I am not going to do this, but I'm just going to go through this slide. So AI turn talk, so this would be if you are teaching a class. Um, for the next three minutes, talk to your table group or your partner next to you about what you've learned about AI so far. Um, each table is going to share after we are done um, with that three minutes. And if you're not sharing that worksheet I passed out, please make sure you're writing on that. Um, if you are not the one sharing, make sure you're recording for your groups. So if you're the one talking, maybe get your um, what you're going to write down from somebody in a bit. And this is a good time to ask questions. Um, talk about how you're feeling about AI, good, bad, a little bit of both. I know I have a few concerns about it. Mostly I feel good about it though. I think I think this is uh, one of those things I see like, oh, we're living in the future. You know, this is awesome. Um, but, you know, maybe you should have concerns or maybe that's the wrong way to say it. Uh, maybe you have concerns. Um, how do you think it's going to change your life at school or otherwise? And how do you think um, how do you think you can use AI? Um, so take another two minutes, write down what you think you could use AI in a productive way for school. You might want to just pause this presentation for this if you're using it that way. So next slide, how do you use AI and how not to use it? So this is what you came for, right? So like we saw in the video a few slides ago, there are multiple kinds of AI. We're gonna be focusing on soft AI more now because that's what ChatGPT is. You have to put the input into the AI for it to do its job. Um, the most known AI is ChatGPT at this point. It's really good. Um, I was so skeptical of it and then I started using it and I'm like, whoa, this is awesome. Um, not only can you guys use it, it is great for teachers. Um, Teachers write a lot of their own lessons. Uh, we write the majority of our own lessons. And sometimes we, um, writer's block is a thing for us too, not just writers. And it's helped me out um, get over that writer's block a couple times already. I have not, you can have it produce worksheets and things like that. I have not had it do that for me yet. Um, I have played around with it a little bit, but never actually used anything I've got so far. Um, but with ChatGPT, it's not gonna like it's soft AI. We need it to steer. We need to steer it to the right place. Um, it's not gonna do it itself. We have to do that. So you can do this by using prompts and parameters. Um, prompts are what you're trying to get ChatGPT to answer, and parameters are how you want ChatGPT to answer. Um, I believe that's on your worksheet, but don't write it down yet. I have another slide for that. And again prompts are the what and the parameters are the how. So more on prompts and parameters. A prompt, this is going to give you the basics on what you need to know. Uh, and there will be examples of this in a bit. An example of a prompt is what is a force in physics? So that seems like something you could Google. The beauty of ChatGPT, and there will be a video on this in a couple slides, um, it's going to give you, like, you could Google what is a force in physics, and you kind of have to search through it. ChatGPT is going to synthesize that for you and give you a nice, um, pretty long thing to read usually. Um, and I'll talk about parameters with that, how to get it shorter. Um, but it's going to give you this nice explanation of what a force is in physics, maybe give you some examples, but I'm going to show you how to make sure it gives you examples. So a prompt with the parameters, some examples of that. Um, so that's going to give you more in-depth answers. Um, you can make it stylized. You can even lower the grade level on the reading or heighten it if you are a um, 
higher level reader, which some of you are. Um, we're going to get your reading results from um, an, uh, your English teacher pretty soon at, here at Roosevelt. So an example parameter, what is a force in physics with at least three examples? So you're seeing that you're adding to your prompt. You say with at least three examples. Um, so instead of one, or if it, get, it might give you like a billion, um, <laughs> it might just keep listing them, it's gonna, it's gonna only give you three. Um, a fun example parameter, so what is a force in physics with at least three examples written as if Homer Simpson was writing? So again, that's a little bit of fun. You're going to see in this video how they think Homer would write these things. And Homer is not the guy I would go to about physics. Yes, he works in a nuclear plant where a lot of uh, physicists worked on this. Um, but he's no physicist. And, uh, you know, I think he's known for being more of a goofball than a... a um, I don't even know his job title. He works at a nuclear power plant. He clicks buttons. <laughs> And then reading level parameters, so, and you can add these. So um, a reading level parameter would be what is a force in physics with at least three examples written for an eighth grade reading level. I chose eighth grade because you guys are in ninth grade now, but you have just finished your eighth grade year. So most of you are probably reading at around an eighth grade level. Some of you are higher, some of you may, may be lower. That's okay. And if you want to combine those parameters, that's okay too. So you could write something like, what is a force in physics with at least three examples written as if Homer Simpson was writing at an eighth grade reading level? So you can combine those, you can lengthen it. Um, and then, so next slide, we're gonna go over prompts and parameters just one more time. Write this down on that worksheet. So again, a prompt, that's what you want AI to find for you. A parameter is how you want AI to tell you the information. So what you want to find, let's go back to that last side, slide. Um, two slides ago, oh wait, whoops. So what is a force in physics? That's your prompt. Your parameter is those additions to your prompt. So again, and I'm gonna pause for about 30 seconds so you can write this down. Prompt, what you want AI to find for you, parameter, how you want AI to tell you the information you want. So if you want it to tell you at an eighth grade reading level, do that. If you want it to tell you as Homer Simpson, do that. If you only want three examples, say that. If you want 50 examples, tell ChatGPT that, but I'm not gonna expect you to write down 50 examples of anything, cause that's a lot. So little pause and we'll continue in about 30 seconds. All right, again, if you're using this for the purpose of showing your class, um, pause for them if they need extra time to write for the purpose of this presentation. I'm gonna move forward. Um, this next slide is a video I recorded of myself doing those prompts, um, prompts and some parameters from a couple slides ago. Um, so here is that, I'm gonna let that video play. It's about eight minutes long, so a little long. Um, this is a time if you are showing this in your class, maybe um, have your students follow along with this on their computers and go around the room and help them as this is playing. If you just want to watch it, that's fine too. Here we go. All right, as you can see, I am on ChatGPT. So how you get to that is you go to chat.openai.com. I already have an account. So, um, yeah, you can see my conversations that I've had with ChatGPT. Um, I've asked a little bit about baseball. I'm curious what it would say, like that, um, that AI opinion, which it's not really an opinion, it's forming an opinion based on input you're putting in. So it's really uh, synthesizing opinions of other people and kind of forming its own in a way, but again, that comes from human-based input. So I want to put in my prompts and parameters from last slide. So on my last slide, um, I had, um, what is a force in physics with at least three examples? So I'm just gonna type that in. At 
least three examples. And let's see what it has to say. It will take a minute to load, and this is, oh. By the way, I want to pause. Um, I skipped a step. I should have started with what is a force in physics. So I started with the parameter, with more parameters. Um, but when you do this with your class, you should start with that simple question, whatever it is. But mine should, should have been, what is a force in physics? That was very fast. Sometimes it's a little slower than that. So here's, here's great job, ChatGPT. This is exactly what I want you to use it for. So one force is gravity. Um, we all know what gravity is. That, that's the attraction between two objects like Earth and yourself. Um, an electromagnetic force, which we'll get into much later in the year. Um, but that has both electric, electric and magnetic forces. Um, and that comes from the interaction of charged particles. And it says, so your example, for example, when you rub a balloon against your hair, that's static electricity while your hair is standing up. And also you can stick that, that to the wall. That's because of charges and electrons. We'll do that later in class. Um, and then friction, so when two things are rubbing each other, um, for instance, when you walk on the ground, the friction between your shoes and the floor prevent you from slipping. Also, that friction when you rub your hands together, which you may be able to hear me do, um, that is also friction, and that's where that heat is coming from. So, I want to make this a little more fun. Um, so, you can rewrite what you wrote. So, what is a force in physics with at least three examples um, written in the style of um, written in the style if Homer Simpson was writing. And this is just for fun. This isn't going to give you any more information. Um, I like to do that, but the computer should correct it. And uh, also, if you notice, my punctuation isn't that great going into this because you uh, don't need it to be. Um, practice your punctuation, though, kids. Um, it can be helpful. So, as you can see, this is in the style of Homer Simpson. Do okay, so like in physics, a force is um, this thing that makes stuff happen. It's like when you push or pull something and it does things. So... Uh, apparently, ChatGPT thinks uh, Homer says, oh man, a lot, which um, I don't remember that. I mean, he, they got the dough, but it's just like an interesting thing you can do. Um, oh man, gravity is the thing that pulls you down to the ground if you drop a donut and goes straight to the floor. So incorporating that donut. Um, and I, I like to do this for you guys because it makes it more fun. Learning should be fun. Um, if you need to write, uh, read something in the style of Homer Simpson for it to connect, that's kind of hilarious. But do that. You know, it might connect a little better if it's in a different style than just you know science language. Um, an electromagnetic force, so rubbing a balloon on your head and your hair sticks to it, like I said before. Um, that's because of this force thingy. It also makes magnets stick together or push each other away. Don't ask me how it works. It's all science-y stuff. So this kind of, a, I, I'd say this is a step back from the last thing, but still just for fun. And then friction, when you try to slide your beer across the table, you guys are not drinking beer. Um, but it doesn't go as far as you want. That's because of friction, buddy. Uh, it's like this invisible hand that tries to stop things from sliding around. It's what keeps your donut from sliding off your plate. Well, kind of. Gravity also does that. Um, so there you have it. Forces are the things that mess with your donuts and keep you from floating away. All true. Kind of fun. So let's get back to um, more serious. So here's a really important one that I like to do for you guys when I give you um, readings throughout this year. I... I plug them into here and have them put in a different reading level. I'm going to do eighth grade reading level. You guys are ninth graders. I know that, but you're coming from eighth grade. So most of you are going to be at an eighth grade reading level to start the year. Hopefully you're at a ninth grade reading level or higher to end the year. So again, I'm going to retype the whole question. What is a force in physics with at least three examples? written 
um, for a, let's say, at a eighth grade reading level. And we're gonna, the, as this is typing, I'm gonna explain, we're gonna go back up and see how it's different. So <clears throat> let's go back up and compare this. So it looks like it's a little more wordy. Um, looks like th that's something, th these are things you probably could get straight from Google, but um, ChatGPT is so good at synthesizing things and putting it all in one place. So as you can see, let's see, um, one, two, three, four lines, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So four, five, five are how, how many lines on this. This looks a little shorter. It looks like you get three, um, four, and then three. So it shortens it down for eighth grade reading level. If you want to improve your reading level, ChatGPT is actually a good place to do it too. You could plug this in and do a college reading level. And if um, if you are um, understanding that and um, getting that information that way, that's great too. But again, gravity, that's a really good example of a force. That's a force you guys all know. Um, so imagine you drop a ball from your hand. The reason it falls to the ground is because of gravity. Gravity is the force that pulls object with mass towards each other. Again, the earth is pulling everything in because its mass is so uh, just bigger than, earth's mass is bigger than everything on earth. If it wasn't, we'd have a big problem. Um, and that's what keeps you on the ground and the planets in orbit around the sun. Friction, have you ever tried to slide a book across a table? You might have noticed that it doesn't keep sliding forever. That's because of friction. Friction is the force that tries to stop things from sliding or moving when they are in contact with each other. It's why your shoes grip the ground when you walk. So kind of saying the things that said in those other two. And then pushing a car. Um, I mean, that's not a force. Pushing, um, pushing is a force, but um, that's not like one of the specific ones I would like test you on in class. But if you've ever helped push a broken down car, um, you're using a force when you push on a car you're applying a force that makes it move the harder you push the faster the car accelerates so now I'm gonna turn it over to you um, and hopefully you get to search some cool things that you want to search about physics all right thanks for uh, listening to uh, me in another place um, so we have a couple more slides, not turning it over to uh, <clears throat> you, whoever you may be. Um, so no, don't play. Okay. So um, before we end this, I want to go over some uh, ethical concerns of AI. And for the sake of it, if you're using this for your classroom, um, pause to talk about this. But for the sake of this video, I'm just going to go through it. Um, so take a few minutes to talk with your table partners or group about the concerns of AI, um, and then we're gonna discuss that. And then take another minute to write down your biggest concern about AI, which is gonna be on that worksheet that hopefully you passed out that is linked on the last slide of this. Um, but let's continue. So um, again, I like to focus on videos. Um, you know, it's it's one thing to teach and just like talk and talk and talk, but uh, bringing it up with videos, even though it is still direct instruction, I think that's helpful for students, especially uh, 14 year olds, which are the students I mainly focus on. So here are some ethical concerns. This video is about three minutes long. Um, here's just the main ones. And then whatever came up in your conversation, um, I also have a slide after this that we'll go over as well. So last video, here we go. I'm Frank Grigich. I do research in artificial intelligence at the University of Toronto and at the Vector Institute. Artificial intelligence is giving us a lot of really great new applications and it's providing a lot of benefit in a lot of areas. But as artificial intelligence moves out of the research labs and into the real world, more and more people are becoming aware of some ethical concerns that kind of go along with some of these applications. So there are three big ethical concerns with artificial intelligence. Uh, the first one involves what we actually use artificial intelligence for. Normally when we develop AI, you know, in the lab, we're developing it for reasons uh, we think are good. Um, I apologize for the choppiness of this. I'm gonna just, um, I'm gonna pause for about 
15 seconds, see if it loads a little more, and then I'll start playing it again. All right, hopefully that helped. Good, so we're using video tracking of people in healthcare settings to make sure they're recovering from an injury or something like that. But the same technology can be taken out and put into smart bombs to track people or be used by governments to track their citizens as they, as they move around, which is sort of uh, Orwellian spooky future, which we may not necessarily agree with. So we need to figure out when we're developing these AI algorithms, what are the potential outcomes that we don't necessarily expect? The second ethical concern with AI has to do with who has access to AI. Increasingly, AI has to run on bigger and faster and more expensive machines. And the only people who can afford those machines are these big international companies, which means that uh, fewer and fewer people actually can control the destiny of artificial intelligence. And we don't necessarily want that. We want all of us to kind of have a say in how AI will be used to benefit our society in the future. The third ethical concern that I see with artificial intelligence is that artificial intelligence doesn't exactly think the way that we do, and it doesn't necessarily share our values. So the risk isn't that you know AI will be malicious against us. The risk is that AI will do exactly what we tell it to do, and then it'll do it in a way we don't expect. The problem is that we tell artificial intelligence what we want, but we define it in a very vague way. And the AI just wants to make us happy, so it'll find a way to do what we tell it to do, but because it doesn't share our values, it'll do things that are unexpected and kind of bad. And the obvious consequence of this is stuff like bias. If we don't tell you know, the artificial intelligence that we don't appreciate bias against uh, certain ethnic groups or genders and so on, the AI might inherently adopt bias from whatever data it gathers. So we need to figure out ways to limit that effect, to make sure that the data we provide to the AI is as free as bias as possible, and also to look at the behavior of the AI and sort of mitigate against the risks that this sort of alien mind behavior causes. I think we all need to have a big open discussion about you know, what AI can do, what it can't do, um, and how we can manipulate things to make sure that it can be used for the benefit of as many people as possible. Yeah, um, th yeah, thank you for watching that. That's something I actually forgot to include on my slides is bias. Um, the people, people who are programming computers and making content um, that AI is feeding off of and getting, getting those, um, synthesizing those answers and stuff for us, um, that, that reflects our society. And our society um, is still predominantly a white male-centric um, society um even even if that extends to worldwide especially in the tech industry so that's just something to be aware of is um ai is not somewhere i would go for the quote unquote truth on things um you know when you're talking to it about physics that that's you know that's stuff that's scientifically proven so that is accepted as the truth but some things may not be so just a little uh, tangential uh thing there but oh uh, messed up on the slide but that's okay we're gonna go for it anyways so another pause this is for the sake of discussion um so some some ethical concerns of ai so again talk to your table partners we're going to discuss that and then write down your biggest concern i think we did that on another slide so my bad on this but a recap um First of all, bias that I did not mention on this slide that I just talked about, um, cheating. Um, we have had students um, cheat with ChatGPT. I had two students uh, cheat on a physics test with ChatGPT last year, um, which I thought was a little ridiculous because it was things they could have just Googled. They didn't need ChatGPT like to take that extra step. But also, they were not. we don't use phones on our tests in here. We don't use computers on our tests in here. So um, when I saw their phones out already concerned, then I saw they were on chat GBT, I was just like, brah, like, come on, what are we doing here? Um, also ways that, let's see, I might have this on another slide before I get too into this. No, I don't. So um, ways that I've seen students cheat on in, in subjects like um, English language arts, instead of, letting ChatGPT help them and like put a prompt in and synthesize it from there. I've had, I've seen students just copy and paste everything into ChatGPT and um, most of your English teacher, the English teacher I work with closest because I realize this is for an audience outside of my school. Um, his name is Mr. Swanson and 
he's had people submit things that say like based on the prompt given to you by mr swanson in ninth grade english and they like the students don't even edit it out so if you're gonna use it that way <laughs> at least be smart um yeah i'm not telling you to cheat but there's ways to uh make it not so obvious if you're doing it also you know a lot of people a lot of professors in college are going to run this through a machine that can tell if you cheated too um also um yeah so which combines kind of with plagiarism um but you know we're, we're evolving into a world instead of plagiarizing other people we're like having robots plagiarize everybody at once and synthesize it and put it into this thing so you can use ChatGPT to help you with English papers. Um, you can use it to help you with physics, but um, teachers are going to evolve too and get better at stopping you from cheating with it. So be aware, um, we have to evolve with the evolution of technology. Um, some other concerns, loss of jobs. Um, that's happened here, you know, that's happened in the past, um, automation. Um, took a lot of people's jobs um, robots in factories took a lot of people's jobs but usually that happens and the market readjust and those jobs get created elsewhere like you know people who go fix those robots um, some people's concerns may be like a robot takeover I don't think we're there yet um, but you know if you've seen those um, I think it's MIT that does those little like jumping robots kind of scary not a huge concern of mine but you know it could be yours and then misinterpretation interpretation of human input so i think that's also a little bit of bias but you know if you're not good with your parameters and prompts the computer isn't gonna know what you're telling it so um like in that video it was talking about how that facial recognition software which can be really good um, and we're video, like videotaping people to help them with their recovery times in hospitals. But also, like I know China is very authoritarian, um, and they do a lot of facial recognition software just in public to track people, um, things like that. And then that has also, and this isn't a misinterpreta misinterpretation of human input, but maybe a misuse, but things like drones. Um, you know, we're using drones which um, aren't exactly automated but are moving that way um, to like track down people, hopefully usually bad guys and, um, you know, kill them from a distance. And um, I have huge, huge ethical reservations about that. I'm, I'm glad we're not putting like troops in harm's way as much, but at the same time, I, I I don't know if that's a good evolution of this um, technology, but maybe we can talk about that. So AI and social media, you are already using AI. If you haven't like found an example yet, this is the one that's going to connect with most of you. Again, this is centered to my teenage audience when I'm teaching. So ways that's already incorporated, personalized recommendations. You guys all get those, like, you know, if you're on TikTok or Snapchat, you're going through, you're going through, and it's not all the, like, pages you follow, but it's going to be things that it thinks you like because of the things you have liked. So the things you are already liking, it's going to be like, oh, you probably like this based on that. Um, so, um which also with ads so that's kind of the same thing a little different so like if i google um like i go camping quite a bit so if i google um i i wanted some fire starter this year i googled fire starter and then it started recommending me like all these hatchets uh, on like my instagram i think hatchets and um different kinds of knives and tents and um things like that so like it's th this is where um I think capitalism combined with AI is very can be very very predatory, um, where it's like, oh, you have this one thing, and we know you like this thing. Well, you're gonna like this too, and then you know, then I'm buying stuff I don't really need. Um, data collection. So um, when you are on the internet in general, your data is being collected, and AI does that. It synthesizes it, and what it's synthesizing it for is those top two things: personalized recommendations and ads. 
and to see usually what other kind of stuff they can sell you. So I, personally, I think that's pretty harmful um, and a little bit predatory, especially when it comes to a teenage audience. Um, a good thing it does is identify fake news. So AI, even um, Twitter, Twitter, which uh, again, I have reservations with Twitter. I don't know if it's a great place, but it can identify fake news on Twitter and it puts little tags on it. Um, I, I don't know how that's evolved since Elon Musk has owned Twitter, but um, if they still have that or not. But I know they were doing that for a while with disinformation. They were even tagging um, tagging things that were like when Donald Trump, um, like after, so he was trying to um, overturn the election results and a lot of things were coming out from like Arizona and Georgia that were misinformation and Twitter was tagging that, which I'm, I'm really thankful of that. I'm glad, um, I'm glad they did that. Oh, quick transition. Um, I thought this faded in, but here we go. So I found this me uh, this infographic about AI and social media. Um, so there's a lot of information on here. So let's focus on this. So 20% AI is the second most effective online marketing technique. So they do that 20% content market marketing, AI and machine learning 14%, big data 14%. So that's different ways it's used. Um, 60 minutes is the time customers expect a response from brands. So if you're Googling something, um, you're gonna like that camping stuff, that's gonna come up in your feed pretty quickly afterwards. I don't think it usually takes 60 minutes. I think it's usually much shorter than that. Um, a lot of people use social media. This is 2018, so I'm sure that's up from then. 16% um, of companies that monitor social media comments I bet it's higher than 16%. That seems low. When is Yeah, this is from 2018. That's five years ago. I think that's way up since then, but I could not find a more recent one. And then um, some uses of social media, facial recognition, we talked about that. Um, Facebook, you can tag people based on their face. Instagram also has that. Oh yeah, they're owned by Facebook. Of course they do. Um, you can monitor illegal activities with AI, so that, I mean, you can, but um, law enforcement can, identifying and eliminating fake news, we said that, that's great, I think that's a great use, um, but then again, bias comes in to AI, so if the if <laughs> the machine is, you know, biased, maybe they're eliminating good sources, I don't know about that, Just just a thought, influencer marketing, so knowing what brands to match to effective influencers. Um, you guys all know more about influencers than me. I, I am not a huge part of that world. Um, content optimization. So that's very much personalized recommendations. Um, identifying potential connections. So that's like LinkedIn. You know, if you have like, if you are friends with three people and they're friends with like, those three people are friends with one person they'll be like hey maybe you should know this person too and you know you can like branch out and again making recommendations i thought this infographic was really good i wish they had a updated version of it though because again that 16 percent, i i bet that's more like you know if i owned a company i would definitely be seeing what people are saying about it on social media no doubt about that so now it is your turn. Um, so here's a link to the worksheet and I'll show you that. Um, but you're gonna continue on, on the worksheet. Um, this link is for educators who want to use this. Your goals are to pick something that interests you in science you don't know yet. I include a few topics, come up with a parameter. I include some of those too. One that's fun, one that's more useful like ninth grade reading level. Um, and write how you could how this could help you in school. Um, I actually skipped that. I want them to write what they learned about in physics. You can modify this to how you want. Feel free to make a copy, and this worksheet's gonna look like this. It's very simple. So the first half, first side, when you print it, is gonna be all stuff we went through um, in this slideshow, and then this is gonna be more of a scavenger hunt so picking a prompt, a prompt, and you can make your own, please edit this as you wish, um, picking a parameter, and then I just want my students to write about what they learned about physics, about a paragraph. 
So I'm going to exit out of that. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Um,